Hello and welcome everyone, I'm James Rose and today I'm going to be going through the free features that come with the 1.20 Ming patch and the expansion features that come with the new Mandate of Heaven expansion for EU4. To start with we'll be going through the free features and then we'll be going through what you get if you pay for the new expansion. Okay, first off we have Devastation. Provinces now have Devastation counter that goes from 0 to 100%. Scorched Earth's Earth and Looting now increase this value instead of having separate modifiers. Unrest slowly increases it in a province as well. So if we flick to the game and go to Normandy here where the French are sieging it down. If we let a month tick by so that they loot the province, you can see the when the whole, uh, cow's head is here. Month tick by, France looted the province and there is now 1.6% devastation here. Devastation affects local development cost, goods produced, manpower, sailors, movement speed in the province, supply limit and institution spread. We can also see if we come over here to Kent, we select our army. See here currently is zero devastation. If we select our army and go scorch the earth, we now have 5% devastation in this province. That gives 0.5% more local development cost, minus 5% goods produced, minus 5% manpower and sailors, minus 1.2% friendly movement speed, supply limit modifier minus 2.5%, and institution spread minus 5%. If you were to multiply those values by 20, you'll get what you have at 100% devastation. Next, we need to look at the... Next, we have added statistics button that opens endgame statistics view in the in-game menu. That is here. So this is a view normally you will only get at the end of the game or when you quit out. Now you can access it at any time and look at how you compare to the rest of the world, how your score does against historical scores and so on. We now have the game has four different ages. Note where you see two lines um, at the start of a paragraph or a line and a start at the end that's where I've made a change to the official patch notes uh, where they've either missed things out in my opinion or where things would be better made uh, better moved to for the video okay the game now has four different ages and they have moved religious locks from before the year 1650 to be valid from scripting age of discovery and age of reformation only if we go back to the game, you can see here we're currently in the Age of Discovery. We click on there. This is a view you will only get if you have the Mandate of Heaven expansion, but I'm going to use it to explain the ages. You start in the Age of Discovery. You get the Age of Reformation, 10 years after Protestantism spawns. You get the Age of Absolutism, 10 years after Global Trade spawns. And you get the Age of Revolutions, 10 years after the Enlightenment spawns. What this means for those of you who don't have the Mandate of Heaven expansion? Well, in the Age of Discovery and Age of Reformation, you have the religious conflicts. That means crusades can be called, Catholic rulers can be excommunicated, Reformation centers can appear, and religion impacts diplomacy. After the Age of Reformation, when you enter the Age of Absolutism, these mechanics go away and you instead get the Absolutism mechanics. I'll go through them in a second. You also have, during a particular age, um, certain disasters can happen. So rather than disasters happening between certain years now, they ha now happen in certain ages. For example here, the English Civil War happens during the Age of Absolutism. Next, we have removed Absolute Monarchy from the game and replaced with a scaling mechanic called Absolutism, which is valid from the Age of Absolutism. So if we open up our console and we go to the Age of Absolutism, then go on our country and select our government. You can see here we have a maximum absolutism value. This is the most the particular country you're playing as can get to. This is affected by a variety of things. As you, here is the 
There are some examples to be seen here. As in English monarchy, we have minus 30, great power plus 5, legitimacy plus 5, religious unity plus 5, and several other things will probably also affect that. The following actions affect your absolutism in this age. As you can see, to start with, we have zero absolutism. At 100 absolutism, you get 40% administrative efficiency and 5% discipline. Things that affect your absolutism are harsh treatment, that increases it by one, increasing stability increases it by one, decreasing autonomy increases it by one per 20 development, strengthening the government increases it by two, increasing autonomy decreases it by two for every 20 development, debasing currency decreases it by one, accepting rebel demands decreases it by 10, assign parliament seat minus three, and reduce war exhaustion minus one. Next, we have added better and worse comparisons to other players in the statistics page. That can be seen from the page I showed a minute ago um, in the top right hand corner. Art of War. If you have the Art of War expansion, automatic fleet transport now docks to pick up and drop off your armies where possible. So if we take our army in Kent and we tell them to go across to here, we get the automatic transport pop up. And then if we let the game run, our fleet will come out of London. They will come round to the Straits of Dover, dock up in Kent, and then dock up in Corks, where they will drop off our army. You can now decide to declare bankruptcy on your own, even if you have, um, sorry, if you have loans. So if we go to our economic tab, you can see here there is a declare bankruptcy button. So if we were to take a loan, we could then declare bankruptcy for five years. That gives us the effects of interest per annum plus five, morale of armies minus 50%, morale of navies minus 50%, manpower and sailor recovery speed minus 100%, advisor cost plus 50, tech cost plus 50, reinforcement speed minus 25, Go global settler increase minus 200, idea cost plus 50, monthly autonomy change plus 0.05, Institution spread minus 50 and yearly absolutism minus 2. Uh, units now have a retreat animation when they are doing shattered retreat. So for example if we were to attack this French army here. And then we see another French army coming in. We realise we're not going to win this. So we decide, now that we can, we're going to retreat to Calais. There is a new retreat animation here. You can see our soldier limping along back to Calais. Um, strength and government now increases absolutism by plus two. We went through that when we did absolutism. Uh, replaced old Celestial Empire factions with the new ones that better fit history and their respective roles. So if we were to tag over to the Ming... The button down here, down in the bottom right, that used to show your factions is now gone. And the Ming have factions like the factions the other countries have. Um, they have the Shizu, the Shangbang, and the Qingwangs. Um, here I added, because this isn't um, counted as a feature, they counted it as part of the interface improvements, but I thought I'd include it on the features. Added new macro building builder, building, uh, I should probably rename that to something better. Anyway, I'll just show it you. So if we go to the building interface, if I can click on it, and we want a castle, you now have a macro builder here that shows you everywhere you can build a castle, how much it will cost. And if you do things like temples, it will also tell you how much the temple will make in that province. And it will give you a improvement value. So how the game rates, how good that um, building is within that province. Okay, now moving on to the expansion features for Mandate of Heaven. States without devastation in a country with positive stability will slowly accumulate progress to being prosperous. Prosperous states produce more goods and are cheaper to develop in. So if we go to Ming and go to the new state interface, you can see here 
um, because there is no devastation within this state. Um, if this state were to become prosperous, then local goods development cost minus 10%, local goods produce modifier plus 25, and monthly autonomy change minus 0 0.05. Um, to get progress towards being prosperous um, develops on depends on your monarch's skill. As you can see here, we gain plus five percent chance each month due to um, our monarch's skill. Our monarch has one in each of their stats. So for every monarch point your monarch has, there is a five percent chance that a state with no devastation. You also have to be at plus one stability, I should add. Will um, increase by one to become... Um, will increase by one towards being prosperous. Okay. You can now enact edicts in a state, increasing state maintenance by 200% for the benefit of, for at least 10 years. So if we go back to our states, we now have edicts. If we wanted to, say, bring autonomy down in this state, we can click this. This will increase the maintenance of the state. So it's three times what it was before. And it will also give the effect as given by the edict. Ages can now have objectives that can be fulfilled and provide power projection if they do. You can now gain Splendor through fulfilling objectives in an age, and Splendor can be spent on purchasing abilities. Abilities for the Age of Discovery, Reformation, Absolutism, and Revolutions have been scripted and implemented, and you can now start a Golden Age that lasts for 50 years. Whenever you have three objectives in an age, this can only be done once. We'll now go through all three of those at once. Let's go back to the Age of Discovery, where we start and go on to our ages interface. You can see here Ming is in a golden age. Ming has done three of the objectives. Admittedly the top ones only happened because I've turned off Terra Incognito, but because three objectives have been completed Ming has been able to enter a golden age. Um, because they've already entered it we can't actually see the bonuses from there. Can we see it from here? Nope, so we'll have to tag over to a different nation. Let's go back to England for a second while we look at the ages. Okay, so if we were to start a golden age, for 50 years you get plus 10% morale of armies, plus 10% morale of navies, minus 10% for all power costs, plus 10% goods produced, and plus 5 maximum absolutism. You can see the objectives here for the age of discovery. If you wish to pause and read through them, do so now. The bonuses you can get from fulfilling these objectives and gaining Splendor are here. To gain Splendor, you gain plus one as a base value. You get and Lucky Nations gain plus one as well, we can see here. Um, and for every fulfilled objective, you gain plus two. At 800 Splendor, you can then get one of these bonuses. These are a new state edict, which gives minus five unrest in that state. Minus 10% aggressive expansion impact. Uh, allows transfer subject peace treaty at half cost and allows claims next to other claims. Minus 100% war taxes cost. Plus 20% cavalry to infantry ratio. Plus 1 to tax production and manpower when you finish colonies. And plus 1 combat bonus in terrain of capital. Additionally to this, in the Age of Discovery, the Ottomans can get plus 33% siege ability. The Portuguese can get plus 50 global settler increase. The Danish can get minus 30 liberty desire in subjects. And the Venetians can get plus 50% to ship trade power. Next, we have the Age of Reformation. Again, if you'd like to pause and read through the objectives for this age, please do so now. The objectives, once you've fulfilled some of the objectives for this age and got your 800 Splendor, you can get a new state edict which gives plus 90% resistance to reformation centers. You can get blockade impact on siege plus one. 
You can get war score cost versus other religions, minus 25%. You can get mercenary discipline, plus 5%. Ship trade power propagation, plus 20%. Institution spread in true faith provinces, plus 50%. And prestige per development from missionary, plus 0 0.3%. Additionally, if you are the Spanish, you can get minus 30% shock damage received. The Muggles can get minus 50% artillery cost. The Polish can get all the Commonwealth, so technically Lithuania could also get that. Uh, goods produce modifier plus 33%. And Persia gets reinforcement cost minus 30%. Next, we have the Age of Absolutism. If you'd like to pause and read through the objectives, do so now. The bonuses you can get for this age are a state edict that gives monthly devastation, minus 0.25. Change rival cost to minus 50%. Fort maintenance on board with rival, minus 100%. Autonomy change cooldown, minus 50%. Harsh treatment cost, minus 50%. Administrative Efficiency plus 5% and Yearly Absolutism plus 1. Additionally, the French can get Land Fire Damage plus 20%. The Dutch can get Yearly Corruption minus 0.2. Swedish can get Manpower Recovery Speed plus 35%. And the Manchu or Qing can get possible Manchu Banners plus 50%. We'll come to the Manchu Banners later. Last is the Age of Revolutions. If you'd like to pause and read through the objectives, do so now. So, the bonuses you can get in the Age of Revolutions are Liberty Desire from Subjects Development, minus 33%. Artillery bonus versus Forts, plus 3. Force March costs no power. Global Naval Engagement, plus 20%. Ignore Coring Distances. Artillery damage from back row plus 20% and Liberty desire in same continent subjects minus 25 Additionally, the Prussians can get fire damage received minus 20% The British can get naval maintenance modifier minus 33% The Russians can get number of states plus 20 and the diplomatic reputation of Aus uh, Austria can get diplomatic reputation plus 5 um, these bonuses only last in their respective ages, and at the end slash beginning of each age, your splendor will be reset to zero, so you can't save it up and use it in another age. Okay, next, added Empire of China mechanics, mandate initially held by Ming in 1444. So let us tag back to the Ming. So, the Emperor of China mechanics can be seen here. You have a mandate value, which um, gives you at 100 minus 2.5 unrest and stability cost minus 10%. At zero, it gives you goods produce modifier minus 50%, shock damage received plus 50%, and fire damage received plus 50%. Um, mandate can be gained by having positive stability, having tributary states, and for each state enjoying prosperity. It is lost by devastated provinces and neighbouring countries that are not tributaries. You can see here some of the effects of those things affecting the mandate growth. Um, the Emperor of China may take the established tributary diplomatic action. And being the Emperor of China gives the following benefits. Bonuses from High Mandate, what we just mentioned. Uses of the Meritocracy mechanics we'll come to later. Can enact centralization decisions, what you see on the right. Um, the Emperor of China gains permanent claims on the chi on the three regions that make up China. Um, these are North China, South China and Xinan. Um, you get a CB to unite China, so if you don't own those provinces, you can use a CB to gain them. And you can enforce tributary on your neighbours. Um, when you have over 80 mandate, you're able to take a reform decision. 
The first, with this um, reduces your mandate by 50 and gives you the benefits of yearly meritocracy plus 0.5. Next one gives trade efficiency plus 5% and an extra diplomat. The third one gives monthly autonomy change minus 0 0.05. Then you have core creation cost minus 10%. And lastly, all of your emperors get monarch admin power plus one. Okay, next, the emperor of China now uses meritocracy instead of legitimacy. It decays by default and increases for each skill level of hired advisors. So if we go back here, you can see we have meritocracy. It's also up here in the top left. Um, uh, by default it decays by two every year and for every skill level of your advisors you gain plus 0.5 a year. Meritocracy can then be spent enacting decrees. Oh and um, at high meritocracy you gain foreign spy detection and cheaper advisors. Um, Admittedly, I'm not sure what low meritocracy gives you. We'll have to continue reading through the patch notes and see if it mentions it. I haven't actually had low meritocracy while I've been testing it. Um, by spending 20 meritocracy, you can enact a decree. You can only enact one at a time. Um, there is national tax modifier plus 25%. Development cost and core creation cost minus 10%. Promote naval officers gives ship durability plus 20%. Provincial Trade Power Modifier plus 25%, Infantry Combat Ability plus 10%, and Fort Defense plus 25%. Those can be done every 10 years and cost 10 merit meritocracy, as I mentioned. Countries in the Eastern Religion Group and countries with Horde Government can now establish tributary states. The tributary state subject will be expected to give tribute every year in the form of ducats, monarch points, or manpower. So if we go to our subjects tab, you can see as the Emperor of China, these are our tributaries. Currently, they all just give us money. If we go to say Ayutthaya, we can demand administrative power, or we could demand mon uh, diplomatic power, military power, or manpower from our various um, tributaries. Uh, that can only be changed once a month. The subject interactions you have are Bestow Gifts, which decreases Liberty Desire. Demand Additional Tribute, which increases Liberty Desire by 25%. Demand Artifacts, giving you 5 Prestige and increasing Liberty Desire by 5%. Grant them Provinces, pay off their debt, and you can send them additional troops, which takes away from your manpower and decreases their Liberty Desire. But this can only be done when they're at war. Um, nations can now ask to become a tributary state under another nation in the Eastern Religion Group and or with Horde Government. So any nation can be a tributary state, but only people with Eastern Religions, which are the um, Confucianists, the Shinto and the Buddhists by default, along with countries with the Horde government type, um, they can have tributary states, but anyone can be a tributary state. Um, added force tributary state CB, available to the Celestial Empire on neighbouring countries. So as Ming, we can go to say Jin Zhao, declare war. They're apparently already a tributary, so a bad example. Oira, declare war, force tributary state. It gives the war goal um, of their capital. And for enforcing them as a tributary state, you have 50% aggressive expansion, 200% prestige, and 50% cost for. Added force tributary state peace option, obviously to go with the new CB. Tributary states can now accept or refuse sending tribute. Trust increases if accept, decreases if refused. A message is sent to the overlord if refused. So if your tributary states have, oh, if you've demanded too much extra tribute and they've gone over 50% liberty desire, uh, they will no longer send you any tribute until their liberty desire drops back down below 50. 
tributary states from history are now disabled if starting game without Mandate of Heaven DLC. Um, I can only assume this means that Ming will not start with any tributary states if you don't have the Mandate of Heaven DLC. However, um, don't quote me on that one. Tributary states can call their overlord in defensive wars, to accept, although accepting the call is optional. So if one of our tributary states, say the Jianzhou here, is attacked by Yerin up here, um, we will get a call to arms to defend them, but we can't call them into wars that we've started. Tributary states can't get the subject nation penalty modifier. Um, the Emperor of China can now use 20 mer meritocracy to enact decrees that last for 10 years and give various bonuses. Only one can be active at a time. We've mentioned that already. Confucian countries now have a harmony value. Harmony effect tolerance of true faith, development cost and legitimacy. And increases yearly if it is reduced. Um, and increases yearly, but it is reduced if you convert provinces to Confucianism and when harmonizing with other religions. So, Confucianism, if you have the Mandate of Heaven expansion, has had an overhaul. You now have a Harmony mechanic, where at 100 Harmony you have Tolerance of the True Faith plus 1. And at 0 you have Development Cost plus 25%, Tolerance of the True Faith minus 3, and Yearly Meritocracy if you are the Celestial Empire, Legitimacy otherwise minus 2. Um, harmony on base value increases by plus one each year. Having positive stability can increase it and the final bonus on the humanist ideas can also increase yearly harmony. Um, so harmony when you convert a province will decrease by one per the development of the converted province. Or when you harmonize a Eastern religion or another religious group, it will decrease by three per year. When that religion is, or religious group is harmonized, it is treated as a true faith. That means that, for example, if we were to harmonize the pagan group, all pagan religions will be treated with the true faith modifier, tolerance of the true faith. Um, and also, upon harmonizing each religion you gain a bonus for a certain number of years um, can't remember what that is off the top of my head right now I apologize I might mention it in the patch notes okay where have we got to Confucian countries can now harmonize with other religions within their group and religion group once a religion has been harmonized into Confucius teaching, the religion will be treated as a syncretic religion with no malice. Uh, Manchu culture nations can now recruit banners from Manchu culture states. Banners don't cost manpower, but cost corruption to recruit and money to reinforce. They give a discipline bonus. So if we tag over to the Jianzhou up here. If we go to a province overview view here, you can see there is a raise banner option. You can see here raising one banner will increase corruption by 0.27%. If you raise a banner, it initially starts at um, a tenth of its strength, so at 100 men, and will then slowly reinforce like a normal regiment over time. A banner doesn't take up your manpower. Um, however, you do need to pay money to reinforce it, and banners gain a discipline bonus of 10%. Um, additionally, I should mention that that can only be done within the states that are the Manchu culture. Okay, you can now give the order to do an artillery barrage for mill power. This creates a breach in the fort, but you need one artillery per fort level for it. So if we tag back over to the west, let's go for France. Um, you can see here as France, we are sieging down Normandy. If this is a level two fort, so if we had two cannons, we can use this button here. 
This will cost you 50 military points, but will create a breach within the castle's walls, giving you a plus three modifier to the siege. Um, the Shogun government type has three special interactions that affect themselves and all daimyos. So if we tag over to Ashikaga, don't know their tag off the top of my head, let's quickly check it. They are Ask. That's not entirely surprising. Should have been able to guess that. So if we tag to Ask. And then open up our government screen. You can see here, as the Shogunate, we have Envoy Travel Time minus 25% and plus 5 maximum absolutism. In addition to that, we have three different decisions, well, uh, bonuses we can take. By giving up 20 legitimacy for 10 years, we can get manpower increase um, plus 6,250, land force limit plus 12.5. This scales to how many daimyos you have. And each daimyo loses 1,000 manpower and 2 land force limit. Again, for 20 legitimacy, you can choose to gain 3 diplomatic reputation, but lose 1 diplomatic relation slot. And you can also... this is, The UI for this is currently bugged. That should say 5% um, liberty desire. So for 20 legitimacy, you can reduce each daimyo's liberty desire by 5%. Um, where did we get to? Uh, five new subject interactions for daimyos. So if we go to our subjects page and click on one of our daimyos. Um, the new ones for the daimyos we have our change isolationism, which we will talk about when we get to the Shinto mechanic. We can conscript their general. Uh, we can force them to contribute to our capital. They lose two development and we gain one. If they've declared a war, we can force them to kill themselves and you gain five times their new ruler's monarch skill in monarch power. And are those the five? Yeah, those are the five. The other things are basic ones for other... Oh no, sorry, return land is also a daimyo one. Um, if they hold land that other daimyos have cause on, you can force them to return it. Um, there is a new macro builder. The new diplomacy tab allows you to list all target countries for specific diplomatic actions. Clicking an action in the list will open a diploma diplomacy dialogue with the target country. So if we go to here and click on the new diplomacy tab down here, you can see all of the various diplomatic actions you can take with various countries. Um, the green value indicates how many countries would accept you doing it. Um, and a red value indicates... Oh, sorry, a red cross indicates nobody would accept you doing it. You also have papal actions, emperor actions, uh, HRE actions, and great power actions. None of which we can access right now as the uh, Japanese shogunate. Additionally, there is also a improve relations tab. Where if we free up our diplomats um, you can choose to send your diplomats to improve relations with neighboring countries um, your own subjects countries that are outraged with you any allies you have or threatening countries and then your diplomats will go and do that automatically and lastly we have the new Shintoism mechanics so there are now isolation mechanics for the Shinto nations. If we go to our religious tab here, you can see we currently have the isolation policy of adaptive. There are five different levels of this from zero to four. They each give different bonuses depending on which level you're at. Um, to change this level, there are eight different events that can occur by various triggers throughout the course of the game. Um, and in those events, you will get a choice of various actions. And depending on your choices, um, you will change your isolationist level. 
should also note that the isolationist level of your daimyos um, does change yearly prestige you get. So if you have lots of daimyos that have the same isolation level as you, you gain prestige. But vice versa, if you have lots of daimyos that are on a dis different isolation level to you, you lose yearly prestige. And those are all of the new features added with the 1.20 Ming patch and the features for the Mandate of Heaven expansion. Um, I've gone through that in a fairly bog standard, these are the facts way. If you would like to see a breakdown of various um, new features and my thoughts on how they can be used and abused within the game uh, please feel free to comment below um, if this has been helpful to you please leave a like if you're feeling extra happy maybe give it a share onto the reddit or any other eu4 forum that you know about and if you thought that this is a complete waste of your time why are you still watching go and hit the dislike button and tell me down in the comments why you didn't like this. I've been James Rose and for now I'll be signing off. Feel free to go and check out my other videos. I've done the first I've done the first hour of a Japan Korea Jianzhou and Ming run in Mandate of Heaven. And if you go and check those out now you can also vote on who you'd like to see in a full campaign after, um, well, starting tomorrow once the patch is fully live. Thank you for watching. I've been James Rose. I hope to see you again. In the meantime, have a good day and bye bye.